Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. This is MTA International USA Studios in Silver Spring, Maryland. My name is Ahmed Khan and I will be moderating today's discussion on Islam Ahmadiyya in America. Our esteemed panelists today are all Brother Al Haj Habib Shafiq of Orlando and Brother Al Haj Yaqub of Milwaukee. Brother Al Haj Habib Shafiq served in the education industry as social services professional, social services consultant. He acquired his master's in public administration. He worked in city government planning, special projects planning. He is a traveler, traveled to Mecca, Medina, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, UK, and Ghana. He has a passion for community service and education, and in his off time, he loves to cook and garden. Brother Al Haj Yaqub served in the military during the Vietnam era. He served as an executive management for proprietary schools, worked in the nonprofit for 10 years, quality control in the American Society of Mechanical Engineers as a code inspector. He's a writer, he's a thinker, and a scholar. In the previous episode, in episode three, we discussed the revival of Islam in America. And we came to the conclusion <clears throat> that there was a, uh, a suppression of, of the propagation of Islam before that. So there was a time period before the Mufti Muhammad Sadiq uh, uh, arrival where the Promised Messiah actually set the precedence and platform through his prayer duel with Dawi and how that was reverberated, resonated throughout the media and a person like also was influenced like Alexander Webb was influenced by that. And then we talk about the arrival of Mufti Muhammad Sadiq and how that changed the landscape of the propagation of Islam in America. And that obviously the government at the time or the society at the time were threatened by this uh, introduction due to their suppression of the propagation of Islam many years before that. So today we're going to further discuss it in the decade of the 1920s, starting with the arrival of Mufti Muhammad Sadiq. And I would like to <coughs> first ask the question to Brother Habib. What made him stick out to the rest of the persons at the time? especially when he first landed in America what what made him unique and and what and how did that have a hand in attracting him uh, to to his message and to him what made Mufti Saab unique uh, uh, as we we have mentioned earlier uh, it was his dress his dark complexion contrast with this beautiful beard uh, and the, the flowing clothes, the curly shoes, but, and the way he wore it, you could see that this was not a costume. But beyond the outer appearance, in my opinion, Mufti Saab was a companion of the Promised Messiah, peace be on him. And he was true to his message and he came in obedience to the Khalifa of the time. This gave him a special so spiritual... As a companion of the Promised Messiah, it resonated in his character. It gave him a special spiritual anointment that came through. Because he was authentic with his message, it resonated, it transcended. I, I, I strongly believe Mufti, Mufti Saab could have been wearing anything and it still would have trans on transcended. On the ship itself, they were fascinated by his message and he Absolutely. used to just basically tell the stories of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, blessings be yes. upon him, and of the stories of Islam. Yes. And because of that, a, a Chinese individual, a Yugoslavian individual, and one Syrian and one American converted. That's right correct. on the ship. Right on the ship before he even arrived. Yes. So that. Uh, so it could tell you that tells you is it was more than what he was wearing, that he was authentic to the message, and his his, his <clears throat> mission. Brother Shafiq, um, how did he deal with the challenges that were awaiting for him when he arrived at the port? He endured them the way the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught all of us to endure. He endured with patience and steadfastness and prayer. These, these particular things were trumped up, they were not true, and yet Mufti Saab, rather than bemoan his condition, he utilized it uh, to his advantage. He began to preach and talk to those individuals that, that were there. In addition, he just did not lay down and roll over, as we would say. He also uh, strongly... He was committed to the mission. Not just the mission, but he, he strongly tried to defend, uh, defend his case. To defend these trumped up charges uh, uh, by mentioning a very powerful argument that 
Polygamy, while it is permitted in Islam, it is a concession and not a commandment. And that this concession has some very strict things. Among them is with respect to the law of the land. Now, if polygamy was really this awful thing, which it, was his main point, actually, it would have been directed towards the Mormons Muslims who were white, break who were law. practicing it already in Utah. Exact, exactly. Muslims. Yes. He made a, a valid point to them, which Absolutely. couldn't be refuted. The Muslims are not are taught to not break the law of the Absolutely. land. So we could tell this is trumped up. So um, that kind of comes to the next question, which is, uh, what, uh, Brother Yaqub, uh, what was his purpose and objective coming to America? Well, his main objective was to come here and preach the religion of Islam so that people uh, could have the wherewithal to convert to Islam. I mean, that, that was it in a nutshell. And. Um, obviously, there was the background of the Promised Messiah al Islam, whose, uh, whose vision of, uh, excuse me, not Promised Messiah al Islam, uh, the second Khalifa who sent him, uh, with the vision of the Promised Messiah al Islam, that the propagation of Islam has to uh, occur in the West in some way or form. And it was prophesied in, in the time of the Holy Prophet with the, the sun shall rise in the West. Right, exactly. And the other piece to that, that the sun shall rise in the West, and the other piece to that, the, the uh, Holy Prophet also prophesied about a white minaret east of Damascus. So Mufti Saab bought the rest of that prophecy by bringing this east of Damascus minaret light of Islam to the West. <coughs> Uh, Mufti Muhammad Sadiq, uh, uh, may Allah be pleased with him, uh, was a very educated man. Yes. Um, he had a, a degree in divinity, um, and he uh, knew Hebrew, he knew Arabic. Arabic. So those are the tools that he was yes. uh, equipped with when propagating the message of Islam. And he had a wit. And, and a wit and a, a that wit uh, attracted allowed him to conver converse with the people yes. who were uh, probably not uh, with, uh, you know, uh, opposite to his culture yes. or, or his understanding. Yes. So why did, um, uh, and I kind of address this to Brother Yaku, sure. why did the government, U.S. government, want him to go back? <laughs> what was wrong with this <laughs> gentleman who was in these simple garbs and fairly educated? He doesn't mean any harm. He said the Muslims um, follow the law of the land. What right. was so menacing about him that they wanted him to go back? And he refused. He refused. He wouldn't want yeah, to Yeah, I, I, I think that he, they felt they, meaning the people who either interrogated him, uh, felt that he was a threat to the establishment. <clears throat> and uh, one, of the, one of the arguments that uh, Mufti used was that if you want to throw me out, then I should write my government and uh, the Indian government and tell them to throw out all the Christian missionaries that are in his country. So, Which was a very strong argument. That was a strong very argument. Very compelling, very and, compelling uh, argument. Uh, it, you know, obviously the people who were interrogating him had to rethink exactly who he was and what he was about. He just wasn't a fly-by-night, quote-unquote, raghead. Uh, he was an above and especially average being person. equipped with the, the scholarship, yeah, and also the sincerity to do it to actually follow right. through. Right, right. Uh, it seemed like that uh, that was also threatening because it would go against their status quo of the time, which was uh, we don't want to bring any other faith into the existence of Christianity. Right, right. Um, which we've kind of discussed in the previous episodes. So. <clears throat> Um, and the other thing, he didn't fit that profile from the 1790 uh, Nationalization Act and the other things that subsequently came after that. Yeah, uh, he, he was... Uh, he was not an Arab, he was not a Turk. <laughs> <laughs> right. He was dangerous. He was dangerous. Right. <laughs> so um, He came from... One thing you have to also mention, that he was a native of the prohibited zone. India was prohibited from coming here. And so they didn't have what you call the immigration pack with India for Indians to come over here. So he was in that zone where they didn't want him here in the first place. Um, this was a time period where uh, alcohol was banned in America. Mm -hmm. um, so bootlegging and all those other mm -hmm. things existed. Mm -hmm. Along with other challenges, um, 
So, uh, what kind of challenges did Mufti Muhammad Sadiq face in his uh, outreach to fulfill his message, to propagate the message of Islam and his mission in America? And if we kind of just give a brief perspective that the government, the U.S. government, was trying to uh, solve the problem of alcohol by banning it, yeah. but Islam had solved that problem 1,400 years ago. And, 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 and solved that problem without firing a shot or anything. But to, to, to answer the first part of your question, it's the same thing that the Ahmadiyya Muslim community is ex experiencing now in Mali and some places in West Africa, that Mufti Saab was gaining a tremendous amount of converts. So much so that they're, 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 the, 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 I, I feel that the, perhaps his biggest challenge was that perhaps he had, he had not had uh, enough tr trained, uh, uh, um, dying with him or trained individuals that could actually keep up with the, uh, the, the pace. And uh, communication was slow, transportation was slow. So I think one of the biggest challenges other than the legal things, but Allah had him it, under his protection, was <clears throat> how fast Islam was growing and how do you provide the tarbiyat, the training, and those things. Well, we do want to mention that he didn't stay the entire decade. No. He had, he had left after about three years or so. So the challenges were who do we leave behind to continue that same work with the same zeal and the trainees that he had, uh, who trained them further and yes. uh, eventually uh, also adopting the title of Sheikh. Yes. Uh, that is a uh, title in Islam when you um, are a, a teacher yes. of Islamic teachings. Yes. So all of that came into play even after he left. Yes. And the people that uh, were... Um, were right in the over. Midwest area. Midwest. And they were gaining converts yes. following the same philosophy. Correct. Of Muhammad Sadiq. Correct. So, uh, uh, what, so that, in, in, in short, that, were, that was also part of uh, the extreme challenges, it, not just during his uh, outreach, but after he left. And, and resources. The, the resources, the Jamaat was uh, not, it was, it was um, strained for resources, and uh, so all, all of these uh, played into that. And uh, uh, Muti Saab, in leaving, he left an extraordinary legacy of individuals who were as who were committed, and they were committed in a very unique area, a, a area that was really proliferating and blowing up, as it were, with industry. We're talking about Dayton, Ohio, my home, Cleveland, Pittsburgh, Cincinnati, Columbus. Um, uh, uh, th these places were. Uh, uh, um, um, a hub for industry and new industry, uh, and so it was just a, a remarkable time. Brother Yaqub, uh, Brother Beeb spoke of that one of the challenges were that there was a, a very expedient growth of the Omni Muslim community, and the maintenance part of uh, training and teaching came into play, but. In speaking of just that success, how, uh, how, why was he more successful in this than other communities at the time that we can mention? Well, Mufti was able to replicate himself around the truth. Um, I don't know of any other way to express that. He surrounded himself with people who were seeking the truth. He taught the truth to them and uh, gave them the responsibility of going out preaching the truth like he did. Uh, That's it. So we want to also highlight of how that success was still happening after he left. Right. How, the, the people who were following his message or adopted the character that he was, did that have a part into play of their success as well? Yeah, mo most of the people, the sheikhs, the, the sheikhs that he trained and and sent out in the field, they were always very successful in converting uh, large numbers of people in their respective cities. As an example, it was one brother who went to St. Louis. I think he converted within one year or less a hundred people. 
And that was the foundation of what we now know as the St. Louis uh, Jamaat or community. Uh, similarly, uh, 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 in the Midwest, these cities such as Cleveland, Chicago, um, Dayton, Ohio, Cincinnati, Ohio, uh, he sent people <coughs> to these cities and uh, these cities have representatives of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community there today. So um, uh, I, I, I would say, uh, not looking for a trick into this, is that he was teaching and preaching the truth. And he was very straightforward. Right. Uh, he didn't mince words. Right. And um, he taught the message of the promised Messiah right. as it is. Right. And of Islam, of Prophet, Holy Prophet Muhammad, right. peace and blessings be upon him. And the content of his message <clears throat> was these colored souls should be treated in a particular manner. And he articulated that manner, and the sheikhs articulated that manner, and the people who accepted Islam, this was not a tacit acceptance, okay, I believe this and move on. Or I'll endorse you and move on. This was an acceptance that, wow, this, this is important, this empowers me, this gives me something beyond um, uh, the mere of, of civil rights as it were. This gives me something a lot more. And then they begin to tell their friends and going to their churches and their family uh, reunions, etc. And so it ha it, 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 and each one was teaching you, one. I just want to mention some one very uh, interesting yes. anecdote about his wit. Yes. Uh, he said that if Jesus Christ comes to America <laughs> yes. and applies for admission in the United States yes, yes. under your immigration laws, <clears throat> stating that the immigration authorities would decide that Jesus would not be allowed to enter this country. Absolutely. Right, right. Yes. And, and he was preaching this, he was directly communicating with the Christians saying right. this is what you are essentially right. doing. Right. Um, so going off of that, uh, how did going to churches help with the cause? And, you know, he, he visited churches. If, yes, if you're going fishing, you go where the fish are. And uh, Haji mentioned something earlier about that he had this, this um, uh, um, focus for the divine truth. And he knew that Christianity, uh, the, the, the Trinity, was not that. So he wanted, to, he wanted to fish. So you go where the fish are. I think one of the things that, uh, and if you will allow me, the basis of his lectures can be captured in these, uh, one being the unity of Allah and the universality. Uh, that's something that Americans were not acquainted with at all. And so the universal spirit of Islam, he talked about the holy prophet of Islam, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He talked about the Quran being the final, uh, final. It, it is difficult book. for them to do that because of what uh, yeah. Brother Abib just said that they had the Trinitarian view, that they separated things and that went against their uh, idea of unity and universal. And, right, right, and and, and and the notion that we need to fight religious wars for the sake of fighting religious wars, he pushed back against that. And he also delivered the message that uh, Revelation was a continuation and hadn't stopped. Was... He talked about Jesus in India. And above all, he tried to convey to the people that you need to be broad-minded. So this was, I don't think the people were opposed to that in as much as that they were satisfied with what he had to teach, whether the majority of the people accepted it or not but they were interested in him. Absolutely. When talking about other communities, other Muslim communities, mm -hmm. uh, Brother Abib, yes. did other Muslim groups even focus on reformation of their people or those who joined them? Did they even, uh, is, was that part of their objective to reform? No, no uh, um, uh, all of the historical and anecdotal uh, observations tell us quite the contrary. Prince As a matter of fact, Mufti Saab would, would, would humbly admonish them uh, they would come to America, their name would be Muhammad, they would change it to Michael. Uh, Latif would become Larry. And he would say to them, you need to be proud of who you are. You need to be proud of this particular legacy. So for the Muslim 
Arab Turks and those who were considered the uh, that he had he had yet another message for them and that is that you are Muslim you should be not only proud of that but you should display it and display it in, in, in a proper manner and they were listening to that as well but did did they have did that? no absolutely not because their agenda was something else and uh, was was there a multiracial community like the Amdi Muslim community out there. I'll just give you a small example uh, of um, a, a Detroit community that was building upon yes. Arab Sunnis yes. and also including Afri African Americans and uh, other Muslim groups. Yes. But it it seemed like their objective uh, didn't last that very long, or it was just a short-lived objective. Yes. While our objective wasn't just uniting people, it was to worship, uh, uniting people to worship God. And again, this was the residue from the prophecy and the duel of the uh, promised Messiah and Dawi. All of this, uh, Mufti Saab was in the flow and in the stream of this absolute divine support, which was the continuation of prophethood and caliphate. So the reason his st stands and still stands and theirs do not is because of that support uh, that the promised Messiah laid that foundation before Mufti Saab even <coughs> arrived, in my well, opinion. It seems that what we've discussed so far, uh, even with all of the, ch uh, the challenges, uh, whether societal or environmental, did not hinder the message of That's Islam, Islam in Ahmadiyya. It did not. But in, in the sense of understanding what happened, how was, can we say this was a, uh, a, uh, a great sign in the truthfulness of the Promised Messiah, not just the way that we discussed before, when the Promised Messiah had the prayer duel with Dawi and then Alexander Webb. It seems like the challenges that he overcame were a sign in itself. I'll give you a, 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 a saying from the Christian. I also want uh, uh, Brother Yakub to, uh, no, both okay, of you, please. to okay. uh, put your analysis on that. So okay. go ahead. There's, there's um, in the Christian scripture, it's reported that Christ said that you shall know a tree by the fruit that it bears. If you look at this tree and the fruit that Mufti Saab bore from that divine sign that planted the tree in the first place. It answers the question. It answers the question very clearly uh, uh, for not only me, but others as well. And that fruit is still lasting, and that is the fruit of uh, Islam and Ahmadiyya. Brother Yaqub, what's your analysis on that? Uh, I always go back to the uh, <clears throat> divine unity and uh, move to stress the universal aspect of Islam, and that is bringing everyone together under one banner to unify mankind, the ultimate message. And in a place like America, that message wasn't, no one stood up and pushed back against it. They listened to that message. And ultimately, you'll find that we're all moving to that end. Uh, we're not running away from it, in other words. That I think people deep down inside know that we all come from the same source. Did he begin to change things in the perspective of how people understood Islam? Because right. before there was no one, right? Right, exactly. And now there is someone like him. And then not just him, but the, the structure that he sent up the setup for the rest of the decade to follow through. Right, exactly. The, uh, the sheikhs who were converting hundreds of people, right. they were following the same philosophy. That's right. correct. Obviously, there had to be some sort of a perspective change on what Islam is amongst right. the oh, of course. many groups. Of course. So um, we can conclude with this episode by understanding uh, the main point is that Mufti Muhammad Sadiq Saab's arrival was a boon on the understanding of what Islam is in America. It gave a new perspective to um, <coughs> to uh, understanding Islam, and also bring up the points of that Islam is a universal religion. Exactly. It it it, it inculcates the values of racial equality, uh, gender equality. And this was very pertinent at the time where people didn't, misunderstood Islam for that. Right. Or they just didn't know anything about Islam at all. Right. Due to the fact now there is someone or, or, or a message that was proliferating throughout the decade. And people were converting in the hundreds and thousands. 
which is a realistic uh, understanding of the context of the time. Right. That could we could safely conclude that Islam was uh, reviving in itself through the message of the promised Messiah, with the uh, arrival and um, the the perpetuation of the message by Mufti Muhammad Sadiq. So, <coughs> the uh, audience members can uh, look for these kinds of information at www.alislam.org forward slash sunrise or www.muslimsunrise.com. Thank you for joining us. This is MTA International Studios, USA Studios, Silver Spring, Maryland, on Islam Ahmadiyya in America. Jazakallah, Assalamu alaikum.